Hey guys, so I've had a lot of people requesting the code for the uh, ultrasonic sensor project, and I've always been meaning to get back to it, um, but I just haven't had a chance. You know, I graduated college and got a job and uh, actually doing the thing that I love. Um, so I figured I'd come back and, and not only provide the code, but to kind of be a better service to, you know, to myself, to you, uh, to engineering as a whole give you a rundown of how it works, uh, how the, the circuit's set up, stuff like that, um, in order to give you a full understanding. Because, yeah, I, I could just drop the very log code on you, but there's so much going on there um, in such... It, I mean, it's not the most extravagant very log project or uh, FPGA project, but there's a, there's a lot going on there, and I, and I feel like a lot of you are... Um, new FPGA users or maybe doing this for school like I was. Um, so I figured I'd show you kind of at least a little bit about how the circuit works and how uh, the code works and then maybe that'll be useful for you. Um, I have posted the code on GitHub and I'll provide a link down below for that. Um, and then the previous video I've also posted um, which you may not see as of now but you might have seen it earlier. Um, and I'll post the link for that down below. So this is the circuit for the ultrasonic sensor, um, just bare bones, right? Like if you were to put this into Eagle or something, it's going to look a little bit different just because, you know, you're going to have um, inputs and outputs that go into the board and stuff like that. But this is the basic uh, basic circuit diagram. You should be able to pick this up um, and put it onto a breadboard and have it work for you as long as you've got some sort of FPGA to work with. I think I was working with the basis 2, um, FPGA board whenever I did this, but this should, I mean, this code should be portable to any, any FPGA. Um, you just have to watch your inputs and outputs and stuff um, and use a top level program to kind of instantiate the whole thing. So this circuit here, you know, you've noticed there's a, basically a, an op amp, if you will, a comparator running um, this, a signal from the FPGA um, and it's comparing it to 3.3 volts, and it'll give you an up or a down depending on that. Um, this was mainly just to cut out all the, the different noise and stuff or, or make it a, an actual static, like a good, strong signal that goes uh, into, the, uh, into the device um, for 5 volts. And I think, yeah, I think, you know, the device is 5 volts also. So, you know, you might be able to get away with driving it at 3, but you definitely just want to just use the specs of the device. So the device is a five volt device um, using a five volt rail to to turn it, to trigger it, to trigger it on and off. Um, so there's an, the, the uh, opto, or not opto, the um, op amp there in a comparator mode, or a comparator actually I think is what I used in the final circuit, we'll see here in a second, um, that basically takes the signal from the FPGA at 3.3 volts and uh, turns it into a 5 volt signal to the trigger, right? Then the echo would come back um, on that A3 line, right? And so the A3 goes to the FPGA. So there's a voltage divider there taking that that echo down to the proper voltage. Um, and I think I'll do a... I've been thinking a lot about this. I, some of the simple circuits, I don't feel like anybody really covers it in depth. I mean, it's, it's a voltage divider, right? Like, simple, just, you know, do a little bit of math and put the thing together. But there's a lot that goes into a simple voltage divider, uh, you know, especially when you start talking about power usage and um, just all the different things, you know. And I thought it'd be cool to, to do a video of that, and uh, if I do that, I'll link it below. Um, so, yeah, it's just running this trigger. Uh, the echo comes back, and it goes to uh, A3 on the basis 2 board. So you come from B2 through the opto into the trigger. Um, the trigger goes out, echo comes back on A3, uh, and is voltage or echo comes back from the device. The voltage is voltage divided down to a to go to A3. Um, so that's the simple circuit. Here's uh, the breadboard of the circuit. I think I, I finally put this onto an actual. Um, I put it into an actual PCB uh, with the other sensors that our group had put together and the other sensors that I put together um, for, you know, we did this for an aut autonomous robot, I think, and I'm sure most of you that find this video are, are working on the same sort of thing. Um, 
so just kind of quickly to go over this, you see the trigger line, you see the echo line. Um, you know, the echo line is basically getting voltage divided down and going back to the uh, basis two. Uh, the trigger line is coming from the, the opto up there, which is an LM339. Um, and I'll, I'll source all these parts in the uh, description just in case you want to pull them straight out. Um, so then you've got, of course, the H HCSR04, which is the supersonic sensor, or the sonic sensor that we were working with. Uh, and, uh, you know, a few voltage dividers across the board. It's really a simple circuit when it comes down to it. And I think the, the more, the harder part of this circuit is actually the, uh, the code uh, for the FPGA. I think most people would run this on a micro, um, but we were given an FPGA, and, and actually FPGAs are way... Uh, way more my thing than microcontrollers. Um, I like all of it, right? But I think FPGA is my passion, really, in uh, in the electron or in, yeah, in the electronics world, in the electrical engineering world. Uh, I love circuits. I love RF stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so that's the uh, the breadboard of everything put together. Um, so let's jump out of that. Let's go look at the code um, as it sits on GitHub currently. Um, so starting at the top here, you know, we do our normal stuff. We set up our inputs and outputs, set up a bunch of registers that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, then we, uh, only on the initial run, we'll set all these registers to zero for a clean start because you never know where that's sitting. Right there. Um, and this is the bulk of the, the program here. So always at the positive edge of the clock to begin. Now, the, the clock that I used on the basis two is actually a 64 megahertz clock that I wound up buying um, offline for a, a different project previous to this, uh, which was actually a frequency counter, which I can do a video if y'all would like, just comment below. But the frequency counter was, it was just so variable and off that we needed a better crystal to put in there. So we bought this crystal and we put it into the, the board and, and that's what these counts are off of. So all this is based on the 64 megahertz clock. Um, so going in at every single positive uh, edge clock, this is gonna happen. So at every single time, it's gonna do a count equals count plus one. Doesn't matter. Now we can reset count to zero, but it, at this point, every single time the clock ticks, we're gonna increase the count, the count by one. The count is a, let's see, we just have earlier, count is a, 26-bit register, right? Um, so then we're going to also set set up another register called not trigger. This not trigger, um, it's uh, the, the count from 24 down to 10, the and of all of that, and then not of that. So the only time count from 24 down to 10 and it will be 1 is when all bits from 24 down to 10 are one and then we're going to knot that so basically this will be one at all times unless 24 down to 10 is one and then it will be zero um, so then we go with we go through and we check out if the count and this is a different subset of that which we can look at here in a second um, if this same sort of set count 24 down to 11 so you're, you're one off here if that count and it together and knotted is one. So if this and it together is one, this will be zero. So when this statement is not true, then it'll run this. Um, so then it goes in and says, if this statement is true, which is that other count, um, go ahead and look for a pulse. So if the pulse is equal to one, we're gonna increase the pulse count. Um, and then we're going to also look at, is there an ending of the pulse? So if the old pulse is one and the new pulse is zero, that means that there's a falling edge. Uh, and if that's the case, then we're going to do count out. We're going to put pulse count out, right? So we're basically just going to change that pulse count number or the, yeah, the, the number we're, we're going to be looking at here in a second. We're going to change that to the actual pulse count, which is what we're doing to, to view uh, how long there was a pulse returned to the unit. And since they're on separate pins, you can watch them at separate times, right? Uh, but once we put that pulse count out, 
then we're going to set pulse count to zero to restart this process. So then after we get out of this, this if statement, we're also going to check if the count out, which we just set, is greater than the determined length of time, right? And so this was just determined on how far away am I looking for the object, right? So this number is going to increase if you're looking for the object further away, and it's going to decrease if you're looking for the object closer up. And there are limitations on that. You can check out the, uh, the data sheet, which I have here, and I'll link it in the description. Um, but if, if, it's, um, if the count is greater than this number, which means that there's an object further away, then status is equal to 1. Or sat, status, sorry, status gets shifted by 1 to the left. Uh, and then status at 0 equals 1. And so this is an actual filter that we'll look at here. But we'll go back here to this, this uh, count 24 down to 10 and 24 down to 11. And I had a slide for that. Uh, it may be a little out of date, but it will still give us the idea, right? So this is, instead of the 24 down and 20, uh, is it 24 and 23? So, yeah, uh, 24 down to 10 and 24 down to 11. So instead of that, we're doing um, 22 down to 9 and 22 down to 10. So, and the reason I leave this slide like this is it, the timing on your unit is going to depend on all sorts of factors, right? It's going to depend on your clock, which mine is different, um, but you can change it to that in 64 megahertz. But it's also going to depend on what distance are you looking for, right? And so we're, this is a different number on this slide, but it's still the same concept. Now, the, the first part is the actual trigger, and, and what I wound up doing was, was changing the, the length of time on the, the trigger, right? So if we look at here, we're doing this AND of the ninth bit all the way down to the 22nd bit. So when all of those are on, then the trigger's going to happen, right? And it's only going to happen when all those are on, and there's a certain period there which is 16 microseconds, which can be calculated. Um, then on the second part here, there's a time when the ninth bit is not on, but all the others are on. That's a delay time, right? And there's, it's actually in the, the data sheet. Um, and that, that actual delay time, if you look here, is going to be the same 16 microseconds, right? So you're going to want to do one with on and one with off, and then you're going to read it from there. So that's that one that one difference. See, we're we're shooting the pulse here. We're waiting. So there's the, the ten to eleven, right? And then uh, we're going to read from here all the way out. So when these two aren't happening, we're just listening for the pulse, and we can listen for the pulse the whole time, since they're on different uh, different pins, right? One's an output, one's an input. So we can listen to that pulse and then measure that pulse back. So that's kind of what's going on there. Hopefully that's clear enough for you guys. And the next thing we're going to get to, which is this here. Um, let's go back and look at that code. So here, if the count is greater, so if this if this distance is further away, um, if it's greater than this number here, then we're going to set up this filter register, right? And so this is basically we're shifting in um a one so we we shift status over by one to the left then we make that last bit a one and so every time this this right here happens we're going to shift in this um, status register block right um, so if it is greater than we're going to shift that in if it's not we're going to shift in a zero so we're either going to shift in ones or going to shift in zeros um, and then toward the end here, if you notice, we did uh, an OR statement on this status to make the state. So let's go look at that, that OR statement and why we're shifting these things in. So here's kind of the, the idea behind this. And it's, it's basically a filter. There's a lot of different things that it's called. But you're shifting in these ones. So if you get this kind of like a false return where there's just very periodically a short period of a one comes through, then this register is going to equal one because there's ors here, right? So if there's ever one that comes through, um, then it's going to equal a one. And it's just going to continue that. So if there's a bunch of ones, but a few zeros, it's going to equal one. 
If it's all ones, it's going to equal one. The only way that this will not return a zero or a one is if everything is zero. So it's basically filtering out these things, these pulses here, right? And so you can use different filters like these OR filters and AND filters to do different things. Imagine if this was an AND filter, this would always be zero unless all of these things were one and then it would be one. So for this, we're using an OR filter, which basically says we start to see that pulse and start counting now, right? And then so it starts counting now where that first pulse was and continues to count from there. And it, it kind of looks like this. It just filters out this, this noise here. So, if we go back to the code, um, that does that, and of course, there's only like a couple of sign statements here, right? So we're assigning the state to be the status, which is that OR filter, and then we're ass assigning the trigger to happen and not trigger. Um, and the only outputs here are trigger and pulse, or in state. And this is actually ultimately passed up to uh, another program. Um, which actually I think will drive an LED. It's just on the top, right, on the top level uh, synthesis. So the this, this state gets passed up to it, and then the, the uh, trigger gets passed up to it. And those either turn on an LED like I showed in the video, or um, actually trigger the device. So it's kind of a roundabout of the code here. We can kind of go through, I've got a few other slides on how this happens, just to kind of give you a, a actual visual, right? So this is recording from my Rigol OSCO, um, where you see the trigger, triggers happening up here in the red, it just happens for a very short moment, and then we wait, right? And then we see this return, and this is on a separate line coming into the FPGA, and then we can measure that return and, and decide whether to control. So that, that control is happening with that state register, right? So we didn't have enough, well, the state register and the, uh, Okay. The state register was ORed for that many times. And then it's also based on this, right? So it's the state register in this. So the state register goes in and says if this is ones all the time, if it just didn't happen for a short amount of time, um, if this didn't just happen for a short amount of time, right? So if this is greater than, it's going to shift in that status. If it stays greater than, so if it just blips in for a second, it won't, it won't see it, right? Um, so what this picture here, or this um, Rigol snapshot is showing is it wasn't close enough to trigger a control, right? And here's, here's kind of what was happening in real time. This is the analog and this is the digital of it, right? So in real time, the signal happens, the trigger happens, you get a return, but it's just not long enough for there to be an actual uh, event trigger, such as turning on and off the road. Uh, in this next one, you see there's a trigger happens, and this takes much, much longer. You have to imagine this is happening over and over and over and over and over, very quickly in time. So I'm keeping an eye on, I've got the actual oscope running, um, and it this pulse, which was this long, was just long enough to trigger the control to come on. And it was still this long during the next cycle of this trigger thing happening, right? So this now, because it's it's much longer than it was before, the actual control is telling the LED to stay on. And this is just the analog representation of that. I'm gonna put this code, like I said, it's already on GitHub. I'll put a link in the description. Um, and then I'll put a link to this manual here. And uh, I'll just link up all the, the different parts and stuff that I used, kind of build a bomb for you guys, just in case you're looking for a single part that I messed with, or uh, maybe you're you know wanting to build the project outright. Um, I could possibly do a video of maybe the green board or anything else within this if y'all want. Um, and I also try to answer your questions below. Um, so with that being said, thank you guys for watching. Um, we'll see you in the next video.